Good morning. We are blessed that you are here on this day, and uh, we know it's fall break, and so lots of people are off doing fall things. I don't know what a fall break is because, I don't know, but back when I was in school, we had no fall break. We didn't, I don't even know what that is. So, um, so anyway, so, but it's a full week, so they're gone. a bunch of people are gone. So, um, so we just pray that you uh, are, and bless that you are here this day. The only thing I do want to point out is because it's fall break is on Wednesday, there will be no prime time. But you can pay attention to all the um, information up on our big board behind me um, through, the, you know, during the um, prelude. Um, but again, at no prime time on Wednesday. So that's an important thing. So any other announcements that need to be lifted up for the good of our church family? If not, to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and, and desire strength, and to whoever will come, this church opens wide her doors and offers her welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's prepare our hearts for welcome and for worship. Rejoice in God, O people, and be glad. Let us shout and sing together for joy as we stand and join in our call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. A day for praise and prayer. A A day day for gratitude and generosity. This is the time God has given us. 
a time for singing and silence, a time for speaking and listening. This is the life to which God calls us. A life of humility and service, a life of faith and trust. If we're honest, we know that we have failed to live as the people that God has called us to be. We have collapsed during the race Christ has set before us. Often we've not fought the good fight, and nor have we kept the faith. The God of mercy waits in compassion to show us this amazing grace that God wants to offer. So together, let us seek God's forgiveness as we pray our prayer of confession together. We are here, O oh God, to worship and to pray. We are here to give you thanks for all you have given us. Forgive us when we feel a bit proud of our prayers and our actions as your people. Remake us when we look down on the marginalized and those who are different. Help us see all people as your beloved ones and act accordingly. Help us truly be sons and daughters of your love and know what we are called to do, no matter our age or our circumstances. Help us dream dreams of justice and then live those dreams into reality as we strive to be your beloved community. When we take your gifts for granted, help us to run the race you set before us and help us to work to make the world what you created it to be. Amen.
Persistently, patiently, lovingly, God pours out grace and joy into our lives, healing our brokenness, and yes, forgiving our sins. Loved, we are sent to love. Forgiven, we are freed to forgive. Grace, we can offer our gifts to everyone we meet. This is the good news we have received so that we are able to run the race that's set before us. Thanks be to God. Amen. So what we have around us are training partners for the race set before us. So let us reach out with the peace and the love of Christ as we run that race. The peace of Christ be with you all. So we make our time during this worship where we lift up our joyous concerns as a people of God, and I know we do a lot of that sharing uh, out there in person, um, face to face, and so we're grateful that uh, you want to share your lives with us. Um, so we work our way through our church directory. We remembered Joe and Hallie Gardner, and we know that uh, you know they lost their child um, a, a number of weeks ago, but they're they're doing well, you know. And they came back to church, and we took good care of them. So, but we still remembered them as they they, they move forward with that loss. Um, we also remember Luke Mitchum, um, Hallie's brother. Uh, Luke just got married. I do have no idea off the top of my head the name of his wife, Michaela. Michaela, I see, that's why I have my wife. Michaela, so I remember them as they journey together. And then uh, Luke has a, a child. We all know her really well, Riley, so remember that. We also remember then another Mitchum, Zach and Sarah and Olivia. Um, so we're grateful for them that they're good, good friends of ours. And our son gr graduated with uh, Zach and our best buds. And so we uh, stay up with them and, and what's going on in their life. So um, we're, we're grateful for the Mitchums there. Uh, well, the church we're praying for is Scott Lyons and Rebecca Lyons uh, Church, where he's now an elder. It's Webster Groves Presbyterian Church, and their loss is their gain, right? And so remember them. Uh, the, our loss is their gain. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, it works. You know what I meant. Um, and we remember Ed, uh, the pastor, has been there just a, a few years they hadn't been there that long, um, and I think they probably have an associate pastor. I don't know the name right off the top of my head. So, do you, Mary Kay? 
Oh, I got a new place to go. Yeah, there you go. I just thought I always wanted to do is be an associate pastor. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, so anyway, so that's to remember them as they're in, in they have a, a really uh, great ministry. Um, they they struggled uh, for a number of years, and I think Ed is is bringing them back. So um, the people that we're praying for on a regular basis, you can see that, and uh, that's both here and in your um, bulletin. But uh, the ones that we want to think about is Virginia Hauser. You know, she broke her hip and she had surgery and. And she's been visited a couple times by Bev, and she's doing really well. Uh, remember, uh, Grammy, um, it, you know, she's doing well, too. If we could just keep tired, you got her locked in the closet and tied down, right? Pretty much. That's the only way you're going to keep her down. Uh, so uh, Grammy is, is doing well. Um, so we pray for, for them. Uh, and we also uh, have the Pat Miller has a... A nephew named uh, Doug that has lung and kidney cancer, and he has an upcoming uh, kidney surgery, and then also after that, then if things go well, he'll have lung surgery. So remember, remember Doug. Any other joys that we have as a people of God? Um, Katie Thorson, our child care worker, and the yeah, K- Katie, our child care worker uh, that takes care of our nursery our nursery worker, uh, she had um, gallbladder surgery uh, this week, yesterday. So she'll be out for a little bit of time. We don't know until she recovers. So remember, Katie. Uh, oh, yeah, Al, Alan Andre's mother, we found out last night. Uh, I was with Paul when we, he got the text from Alan that his mother had a mini stroke. Um, so remember, and you know, they have come to church here for years um, um, visiting. So I remember them, good Presbyterians in St. Joseph, Missouri. So I remember that. Anything else? Well, we had a great joy last week that uh, we celebrated Nancy, and, and it, was, it was just a great time to show her our love and, and support. So I want to thank you for uh, all that you did, and it was, it was a great time, and just good food and, and good time, and, and so we're grateful that this is a church that cares in real ways and for the committee that did such fine work. So thank you. Anything else? If not, let's continue in prayer. Lord God, pour out your spirit upon us as we gather so your grace might be strengthened us for service, so your peace might calm our troubled souls, so your hope might mend our broken hearts. You poured out your life so we might be filled with the gift of salvation. You humbled yourself so we might be raised to eternal life. So take hold of our hands, servant of the world, so we might finish and cross the finish line together. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness in us, especially during these difficult times. Help each of us to run with perseverance the race that you set before us and to finish that race well with your help. Help us to keep the faith and the teaching that you entrust to us and pass it faithfully to the next generation who can teach others also. Spirit of wholeness, you are here. You're in our midst. And we know you'll be with us to the end. So enable us to cling to our faith, especially when hope runs through our fingers like sand. Open the gateways of our hearts morning and evening so we might sing our praises with all creation. So now as we run the race that we are in and we try to keep the faith and fight the good fight, we pray especially for people who are sick, hungry, lonely, poor, for the cities and neighbors where we live, for the people and leaders in other countries, for peace and fairness for all people, for all God's creation and creatures, clean air and water and soil, and for the work of the whole church to show and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. God in community, holy and one, we pour out our hearts to you as we pray as Jesus taught us by praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts to receive God's life-giving words. Let us pray. Empty the rushing of our minds, Holy One, and the noise that blocks out your message. Open our hearts and minds to the words we are about to hear. Seal them in our hearts so that we are empowered to be your servants in the world. Amen. Let us listen for God's promise to rescue us from life's catastrophes. The promise comes from the Oracle of Salvation in Joel chapter 2, verses 23 through 32. People of Zion, celebrate in honor of the Lord your God. He is generous and has sent the autumn and spring rains in the proper seasons. Grain will cover your threshing places. Jars will overflow with wine and olive oil. I, the Lord your God, will make up the lo- for the losses caused by those swarms and swarms of locusts I sent to attack you. My people, you will eat until you are satisfied. Then you will praise me for the wonderful things I have done. Never again will you be put to shame. Israel, you will know that I stand at your side. I am the Lord your God. There are no other gods. Never again will you be put to shame. Later, I will give my spirit to everyone. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will have dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will even give my spirit to my servants, both men and women. I will work wonders in the sky above and on the earth below. There will be blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will turn dark and the moon will be as red as blood before that great and terrible day when I appear. Then I, the Lord, will save everyone who faithfully worships me. I have promised there will be survivors on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and among them will be my chosen ones. This is the letter of hope to God's hurting and separated people. Maya, Masamba, come on up, since I think you're the only two here, so I can call you out by name. Fall break. When, when do I get a fall break? Howdy. How are you all? Good. So... What's the farthest you've ever run? Have you ever run very far? A mile once? Okay, well, a mile? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that, that, that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? All right? But, you know, there's crazy people like a- Angie and me, we, we run have run 26 miles at one time. No, not, not in our life. Some of you haven't even run 26 miles in your lifetime. I understand that. And so we're talking about today, uh, the Apostle Paul actually was an athlete. And uh, so he likes to use athletic imagery and, uh, and tell stories. And so today he's talking about run the race and finish the race. And so it's, he's talking about a marathon, and we're not ta- And he's talking about more than 26 miles. He's talking about a lifetime. So do you, could you go out and run five miles right now? Maybe. What about 10 miles? No. What about you? Could you run five miles? You could? 10 miles? <laughs> 30 miles. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so, because I couldn't even run that far right now. So, yeah, and so, so how do you get ready to, to actually run that far? How, what do you do? Do what? Trying. trying? So you just try one time. You just go, I'm going to run 30 miles. You do that? Is that how you do it? Okay, I, I, you know, I believe in myself, but I'm, I don't think, anybody here, anybody, everybody here believe in themselves? 
Anybody here believe that they can go out and run 26.2 miles right now? Nobody. So it's more, I don't think that's it. So what do you think? How do you get ready for that? What do you do? So how do you get better at playing piano? You practice, okay? Training. You have to train. So training. And so when Paul tells us about finishing our race, that means we have to train for a lifetime. And what we're doing this morning is considered training. And when you go to Sunday school, that's more training. And you go to prime time, that's more training. And you do prayers at home, that's more training. And the more you train, and more that you hear God's word, and you find out how you're supposed to live your life, and, and you're around your other people that are also training, then you turn around and you could run that race and finish the race. And you don't just keel over and throw up. Because if you try to run 30 miles, sister, that's what you would do. Yeah, don't give me that evil eye. She's giving me the eye. She's giving me the eye. You're just like your mama. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So we're going to train. So I'm, we're glad that you guys are here all the time and that you help us with, you know, when you've helped us with Advent candle and, and light that and read and you light the, the Christ candle and you go to all the events because you're going to get ready for a lifetime a fun and hard journey that we call our faith. So we're so glad for you. So let's pray. Gracious God, we praise you and thank you that uh, that we have these two here with us. You know, Masamba and, and Maya are so fun and so many of our kids, and we love them so much. And we pray that they'll continue to train, train in the way uh, they're going to go. Because we don't know what the road or how far they're going or which direction or whatever the race might be. But we know that they're doing well, and we'll be with them every step of the way. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, I guess I, for I forgot that, didn't I?
epistle lesson for this lectionary Sunday, 20, 20C, if you want to if keep in track of what lectionary day we are on, because I'm sure it keeps you up at night, comes to us from 2 Timothy, and that, you ought to find that, it's pretty simple, you just got to find 1 Timothy. Once you find 1 Timothy, there's 2 Timothy right after that. That's a simple direction, right? That's how that works. It's toward the back of your New Testament there. So 2 Timothy 4, and we're reading verses, uh, what are we reading today? 6 through 8 and something, or just that, just 6 through 8. What did I tell you? And 16 through 18, okay. Uh, probably should have read that before I did this. 6 through 8. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, and 16 through 18. Here's what Paul tells us as a training manual. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. At the end of my life, I could honestly say I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I've kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be proclaimed to all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. These words of encouragement are part of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the people of God said, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Amazing God, strengthen us for the journey ahead. Lift our eyes to the hills that we might see the light of your gracious, loving presence. In the sacred words we read and wisdom I now share, open our minds to your visions and dreams that we may claim our place as your children. And we may run with faithfulness the race set before us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Recently, I've, I've signed up for Apple News on my iPad so I could read articles about the Kansas City Chiefs from the Kansas City Star. Now, if you don't know what Apple News is, well, it's a subscription service that gives you access to hundreds and hundreds of periodical, periodicals like the Kansas City Star and Wall Street Journal and Sports Illustrated and, and running magazines like Trail Runner Magazine and uh, my favorite is Runner's World. Now, if only I had time to read any of those periodicals, right? Each day, my, my iPad gives me the top stories, especially stories that I might be interested based on what I have read and I've looked up on my pad, which is always scary. They seem to know me better than I know myself. So the last couple of weeks, it's been suggesting I read some advice from Runner's World, like, how to prepare for a marathon or common mistakes when running a marathon. Now, I realize almost none of you are, would be interested in any of those articles, and some of you are probably sitting there thinking to yourself, well, the common mistake in running a marathon is running a marathon, right? <laughs> okay. And as I looked at these running headlines, thinking about today's sermon, I was reminded of a woman who did make a stake in running a marathon, but also, like Paul, finished her race. True story. Her name was Georgine Johnson. And one day at age 42 in downtown Cleveland, she ran a marathon by accident. All 26 miles and 385 yards of it. It's not the 26 miles that's really hard. It's the last 385 for it, like we like to joke about. If I remember the story right, it seems she really wasn't paying attention and lined up too early for her race and ended up in the wrong queue at the starting line. Not the 10K group where she belonged and had trained for. That was to start 30 minutes after the marathon started. 
she instead jumped in early with that 26-mile group where she didn't belong. And it wasn't until mile four that she realized her mistake. So she stopped and she asked the police officer to give her a ride back downtown, but he didn't have a car. So she just kind of started running again. And as she did, her head popped up and she saw a man with a t-shirt that said, just do it. And so she said, well, okay. And she just kept going. And she finished the race, and this is what ticks me off, because yeah, four hours and four minutes, right? But it's what she said later, by the way of trying to explain herself, that really has stuck with me. Georgine prophetically coached us by saying this. Listen to this. This isn't the race I trained for. This isn't the race I entered. But for better or for worse, this is the race I'm in. This is the race I'm in. Which is more true than you might actually think. Relatively few of us are exactly where we figured we would be at this point in our life. Doing what we thought we would be doing at the beginning of our adulthood, right? But where we are, for better or for worse... We keep our feet moving, pressing on, fighting the good fight, keeping our faith until we finish the race that we are in. In today's race language, the author of the letter to Timothy talks about running, uh, about finishing the race. And if you notice, it says absolutely nothing but how long that race is going to be, how long we have to run. But it says volumes about whether we get to choose. We don't. It's just there. It's set right before us, not entirely of our choosing. And when Paul talks about finishing his race, notice that when it is he finally decides to hang up his running shoes. Not when he's tired. Not when he thinks the race should be over, but just prior to his death. That's when. And what a difficult marathon Paul had to run. And like Georgine, he didn't exactly prepare and train for his race journey. But for better or for worse, Paul ran the race that God put him in. If you're getting the idea that, biblically speaking, the words race and life are interchangeable, well, you're catching on fast. Which says something about the goal, doesn't it? Which also says something about our training. If discipleship were a sprint, the goal would be right out in front of you. You would easily be able to see it, and you would readily reach it in your lifetime. Now, maybe you wouldn't be first, but you certainly wouldn't be last in your race. Just a quick burst of energy, a short sacrifice of effort and time, and man, we are there. But the question is, there being where? The possibilities of short races are endless for us. Foot of the cross, for me, to be on the lap of Jesus by the side of the Lord, numbered among the saints, gathered as sheep by the still waters, safe and secure. After all, we're thinking to ourselves, how far can this race actually be? A simple sprint from here to there, wherever that is, a simple step from there to here. Or maybe not. Because if that's what you think, when, then I have some really bad news for you all this morning. When you said that you would follow Jesus Christ, then you lined up in that faith marathon, a line unbeknownst to you. And most of us are on the way. And most of us are way, way, way beyond 
mile four, right? And we're still left with miles and miles and miles to go. Down roads not always clearly marked. Toward finish lines that's not always reachable in our lifetime. Think about this. If I'm telling you the truth or not. Think about the few biblical characters that you might know. How many of them who went with God arrive at the destination they had in mind when they started? And have you noticed of those of whom it said they walked with God, they actually wandered far more than they actually marched with God? I mean, we could take probably the the perfect model for us for that would be Abraham. At a time at life at about 75 years of age, when he thought he had everything nailed down and he was ready just to break that finish line, said, I've arrived, right? He was told, hey, get your wife, get your nephew, load up a one-way U-Haul and wait for further instructions. A different line unbeknownst to him. And if the letter to the Hebrews is to believe, ever since that day, faith as we know it has been one long lasting race toward God. You can't read the Bible without discovering the big names of biblical history, right? And in spite of their courageous and heroic living, hardly any of them, maybe none of them, quite made it to where they thought they were going. Never quite found what they were looking for. And not quite receiving all the good stuff that they were promised in their lifetime. Strangers in exile is what the author of Hebrews and the Apostle Paul loves to call all of us. All of us are looking for a home in a country that shall never quite be ours. But we should have a willingness to look for it and to walk and jog and maybe crawl or run toward it. And it's doing those things one step at a time that makes all the difference in our faith journey. If that sounds strange, consider the fact that those initially agreeing to follow with Jesus didn't have the faintest idea where they're even going to camp that first night, right? Let alone what they were going to do for breakfast the next morning. All they knew is an accepting in the strange man that they decided to follow and accepting his invitation, they lined up in a really different line. They embarked on a journey, and at at times they said, I must be in the wrong race, because I have no idea where this finish line is and that where it looks like it's going is a place I don't want to go. They had no idea what course they were going to take, if they were prepared or trained properly to complete this weird and strange journey of faith with Jesus. If all this sounds more like a marathon than a sprint, it's meant to. Sprints are run indoors, like in churches on Sunday morning, right down here in the center aisles, a hundred yards or less. Marathons have to be run outdoors, over all kinds of terrains and all kinds of conditions, sometimes with great support, or sometimes you run in Waco Marathon that you don't see someone for literally two miles with no support. The phrase, the loneliness of a long distant runners is something that any of us has run any distance at all totally understands because it really speaks to our souls. I mean, to be sure, the long distance running can be somewhat of a team sport. But in the end, every single runner, we have to run our own race. 
the one that is in keeping with what we bring to it and how we have trained for it and how we feel on that particular day. For any of us who've run a half marathon and beyond, we understand this fully. Even though we might train with the team and with friends at the same pace, on the same course, at the same old God hundred every Saturday or Sunday morning, we run countless miles side by side by side, and we talk and we laugh and we cry. When it comes to the race day, we are on our own, totally on our own. And you say, well, why is that? You train with these people because we have to run our own race based on our own goals, based on how our body and mind and soul feels on that race day, based on how we ate, based on how we trained on the days we worked together. You see, it's hard. It's impossible to race anybody's race except our own. And I would contend that there's a similarity of solitariness, loneliness to the Christian journey as well. But the good news is that we know that we aren't alone alone, right? We're not solitary solitary. Some of us are there with you right? We're, we're not step to step with you. We're not going to go stride with stride with you. But even on that road, you know we're out there somewhere. You know that we are suffering like you are suffering. You know that we are hitting the same mark somewhere along the line as you are. You know that right around the corner, you might catch a glimpse of us, or some of us, we could look behind and catch a glimpse of us back there, right? So we're out there with you. We're really, really out there with you, along with this other guy who walks that road with you still, closer than our hands and our feet, nearer than our pulse or our breath, Jesus. So yes, it's our race, and it's often solitary, but like I said, this faith race that we are on is somewhat of a team sport. If it weren't, why do we need churches, right? But the older I get, the less comfortable I feel with churches and preachers who say that ours is the only race. Ours is the only place. Ours is the only pace, and ours is the only steps by which people get from here to there, wherever that is. It's not so much what they say, our way or the highway, so much as they say, our way is the highway. But that's a whole other sermon, and I'm not going to preach that here. This morning we hear Paul tell us about his way. Paul's way, not our way, Paul's way. His journey, when he shares, and when he began his journey, he shares these words. I, I mean, when he finished his journey, he shares these words in his letter. I have run the race. Having given the best, Paul now sees himself as finally crossing the finish line. But I can guarantee you, guarantee you, where Paul ended up, was nowhere where he began or where he thought he was going. You see, it's easy to begin any race, whether you train for it or not. It's easy to begin. And it's re- easy to run a few steps. And like our young ones, it's easy for them to run even a mile or two, right? Right? But it gets harder the farther you go. And harder still to actually finish strong. I believe that Paul is telling Timothy and each of us that Christian life, the life of faith, is not a sprint competition. 
A straight line from point A to point B, brother. It's a, a long, distant journey, a, a marathon-type challenge with ups and downs, with winding paths, with wrong turns and dead ends, with obstacles to jump over, to go around, about changing weather, about danger, toils, and snares. And Paul is begging us to run it well. To keep your pace. To stay focused on your particular goal. And to finish strong wherever your faith journey is taking you. Years before he finished this race, in John 20, when he's beginning his race, he said this. I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task that Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. And now here in 2 Timothy, Paul looks back, and he's finally able to say, for better or worse, this is the race I've been in, and I've run my race to the finish. May we do so likewise. Let us pray. God of grace, at the starting line of each day, may we call on your name. As we run the race you set before us, help us keep our eyes on your goals, not our own. When our faith falters, give us fresh strength. When we are feet floated, let us give you the glory. And in the words and actions of our lives, may we dream dreams and have visions as what is possible through your grace and your guidance as we run our race wherever it might lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God has dealt wonderfully with us. We have what we need. Now we are called to share from our abundance to support the work of God through this church. Bring your dreams, bring your visions, bring your prayers, bring your presence, bring your gifts, and bring your witness. All of these offerings that we put in the plates by the exit doors, send into the church office, or give online on our church website are blessings to God.
Let us pray. We rejoice in you, O Lord. You have poured out upon us blessings like abundant rain. Our threshing floors are full of grain. Our barrels overflow with the wine of your goodness. And so we offer you what we have, our resources, our time, our energy, our very selves for your ministry in the world. In thanksgiving and gratitude, we ask that you transform these gifts into blessings for a world in need. Amen. My friends, go forth with confidence and humility as visionary sons and daughters of our Creator. And as you go, keep the faith, even when doubt is all around. Fight the fight when justice and love seem so far away. And run the race with confidence, for Christ is leading the way. Amen. Amen.